Our scripture this morning is found in Matthew chapter 11. We're going to be looking at verses 25 through 30. Particularly, we're going to read those verses. Particularly, we're going to be looking at verses 28 through 30. Matthew 11, verses 25 through 30. Familiar words of Jesus, where he calls us to come to him for rest. Matthew chapter 11, beginning with verse 25. This is the word of the Lord. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's God's word for us this morning. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we all know what it's like to be tired, to be weary. And there's several forms of tiredness that uh, we, we go through. One obvious one is physical. Uh, if you put in a hard day's work uh, or maybe a vigorous exercise, uh, you're going to be tired. Your body's going to be tired. And so physically, we can be tired. Another is mentally tired. If you overwork your brain, so to speak, and uh, you're working all day on, a, on trying to solve a problem, and at the end of the day, you just feel brain dead, so to speak. I remember when, um, when I took the test to become a professional engineer. It was an all-day test, and at the end of that day, I just felt my brain was just washed out. I, I couldn't think about anything else. Sometimes we are uh, mentally overworked or mentally tired. There's another, and that's emotionally tired. Uh, I'm sure that there are a lot of people yesterday who have been affected by 9-11 who are once again emotionally tired and weary. Uh, I can remember uh, when, when we had a young family and uh, we had five kids and when I came home from work, my wife was emotionally tired dealing with five young kids. Well, sometimes we might get all of those uh, types of tiredness. And, um, but there's one other tiredness or weariness that we haven't mentioned. I think it's one that most people don't even think about. And I think it's one that maybe we don't think about a lot either. And that's weariness or tiredness of the soul, being spiritually tired. You know, we, 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 that's one of the other things that we can be tired of when you think of uh, how Moses summarized the law in Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. He says, we are to love the Lord with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. The heart, emotional. The mind, mental. Strength, physical. But he also says the soul. And we can become tired in the soul. How, how can that happen? What makes us tired spiritually? Well, I think one way that people become tired is people who try to earn their salvation. They try to do everything that they can in order to please God and find out that they just fall short. And so it becomes a burden to them to try and do that. Another way that people try become tired spiritually is to try and please God. That they do so many things to, to please God, thinking that if I don't do this or I don't do that, I'm not going to be in favor with God. And they find out that, once again, they, they, they just can't because they're not perfect. Another is maybe doing, overworking ourselves doing good. Paul warns about this in Galatians 6, verse 9. He says, let us not become weary in doing good. You know, some people, everything, that they, they think that they've got to do everything that the, that, that's being done in the church, that I've got to go to this, I've got to go to that, I've got to serve on this. And those are all good things. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes we can get spiritually weary in doing those things. And of course, the one that I haven't mentioned yet and that Jesus refers to here is sin. 
struggling with a sin may be a burden. Maybe it's something that we've been praying about, we've been trying to, to, to throw off, but we find out that it just keeps clinging to us and it becomes a burden. And sometimes when that happens, we can even question our faith and that could become a burden as well. So we can be spiritually tired in addition to physically and mentally and emotionally. And people are looking for rest, but unfortunately, a lot of people are looking in the wrong places. People think that, well, if I only just take a couple of days off, but um, you find out that a couple of days is not enough. Or maybe if I just go away, get, get, get out of my house, get out of job, but we find out that we still have to come back. Or maybe people decide I'm just going to drop out for a while and I'm just not going to go to the prayer meeting, I'm not going to go to Bible study, maybe not even go to church. But those create other problems for us. In fact, you might call those things apparent rest. Let me explain what I mean by that with, a, with an example. In drinking water treatment, one of the parameters that we use in order to determine whether the, the water is safe or meeting standards uh, is color. And if you take a sample of water out of a, a reservoir or a river and you, you do a color analysis on that, that color in there is called apparent color. Now, what we do then is we take that water and we pour it through a 0.45 micron filter and the water that comes out of that, we take the color of that. And that's called true color. And the reason why it's called true color is because it color, it's color that will last. See, when we just take the water out of the uh, lake or reservoir, uh, a lot of that color is associated with particles in the water, and they'll eventually settle out. So that's not real color. True color is what's filtered out, it, what lasts. And we're looking for rest that lasts. We're looking for true rest. If, if all we needed uh, were, to, were to be strengthened physically, we could eat something, take a nap, get a good night's rest. If it were just mental or emotional, maybe we'd get away for a couple of weeks. But what about spiritual rest? How do we find spiritual rest? You know, when we do find it, when we have spiritual rest, it puts us in a better frame of mind to deal with tiredness, or with, with physical tiredness, with emotional and mental as well. Well, Jesus says here in our scripture this morning, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. True rest. Rest for our soul. Well, let's look at these verses by first of all looking at Jesus invitation second Jesus promise and third Jesus offer Jesus invitation his promise and his offer so first of all his invitation he says come unto me all you who are weary and burdened now let's look at the invite itself and then we'll look at the invitees Jesus says come now when he says that it means that we have to do something. We can't just sit there. We have to go from point A to point B. It's like when someone calls you to dinner, you may have to go from the living room or the, the family room or, or outside. You've got to come into the kitchen. You've got to do something. You've got to come from where you were. And it also implies that you've got to leave something, leave that room. Or in Jesus' case, maybe you have to leave a person who maybe is leading you in the wrong direction or a place that you shouldn't be going to, or something that maybe is getting in between you and God, and that's keeping you from finding that rest. And also implied in Jesus' command here is empowerment. Because if Jesus says come, it means that we can come, that he gives us the power to come. I think of the, the event when the disciples were out on the lake, uh, Sea of Galilee, fishing all night, and, um, and they, they, in, the, in the early morning hours, before dawn, they see someone coming, walking on the water. And when they find out that it's Jesus, Peter says to Jesus, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus says, come. 
And Peter's able to walk on the water until he takes his eyes off Jesus. But Jesus wouldn't have told him to come if he knew that the minute he stepped out of the boat, he'd sink into the water. Jesus empowered him to come. And when Jesus tells us to come unto him for rest, he empowers us to come. And and where are we to go? He says, come unto me. He didn't say to the people then, you know, go to the synagogue, go to the temple, or for us, go to church and find rest. He says, come to me. It's not where we go, it's but to whom we go that is important. And in order to come to him, we need to believe in him. We need to trust in him. And we come to him through prayer, through his word, through worship, through fellowship, Bible study, all those ways that he empowers us to come to him for rest. And then, who are those who are invited? He says, all who are weary and burdened. Some other translations say, those who are toiling and have been burdened. Or, come unto me all who are tired and carrying burdens. Especially, the burden of sin. And it's not just for the people of that day. It's for people like us as well. Jesus invites us to come to him for rest. I would dare say that every single person here this morning, except maybe some of the kids, that all of us are carrying burdens. It may be a small burden. It may be a big burden. Um, It may be many burdens that we're carrying, but I would dare say that every single one of us here is carrying a burden. I am. Maybe you are too. Maybe you're thinking of that right now. And we might have a smile on our face and say that, yes, we're okay, but we're carrying burdens. Maybe it's a burden uh, of financial needs. Maybe it's health-related. Maybe it's uh, grief-related. Maybe it has to do with the church, it has to do with family, it has to do with the job. Maybe it has to do with a sin in your life. Once again, a sin that just has become a burden to you. You've been trying to get rid of that sin, but it just still clings to you. We all carry some type of a burden. In terms of sin, the psalmist says, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden, too heavy to bear. I've been volunteering at New Hope Ministries in Prospect Park for a number of years. And uh, before COVID hit, uh, when we had food distribution on uh, every other Saturday, there would be several of us who would meet with the people uh, who came for food. And we would, we would talk to them about uh, their lives, and we would pray with them. And, and there was one woman I remember um, who every time I met with her, She would bring up a sin that she had in her life that was just a burden to her. She didn't say what it was, um, but every time she talked about it, she would break down and cry. And she just didn't understand that Jesus has taken away our sins. But that has had become a burden to her, so much so that she would cry when she just thought about it. Well, those of all of us, carrying burdens, Jesus says to us this morning, come to me, come to me, all those who are weary and burdened. And when we do, he gives us a promise. He says, I will give you rest. Let's look at each one of those words here. He says, I will give you rest. Only Jesus can give us the rest, that true rest, not apparent rest, but true rest for our souls. Not Muhammad, not Buddha, not some other person. Only Jesus can do that. Listen to these verses about rest. Psalm 23, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restoreth my soul. Psalm 91, I will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. You know, I don't know how many times I've read that and, and just read right through it, but In in looking at it from the perspective that we're looking at this morning, it made me stop and think. I will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. If you're going to find rest or relief from the sun or the heat of the day, 
and you want to find that in the shadow of a tree, where would you stand? You wouldn't stand 100 feet away. You'd stand as close to the tree as possible to get in its shade. And the psalmist is saying here, when we, if we want to find rest and be in the shadow of the Almighty, it means that we have to be close to God, that we must be near to Him in order to find that rest. Jeremiah 6, verse 16 says, Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. You see, when we walk in the good way, we're walking or we're being in the shadow of the Almighty. They go together. In Psalm 62, verse 1, the psalmist says, my, fo- my soul finds rest in God alone. And then he says in verse 5, find rest, my soul, in God alone. Let's go on. Jesus says, I will give you rest. It's a promise. It's a promise that we can count on. We can take to the bank, so to speak. And, and somebody might ask, well, how can I trust that that is a promise, that God is really going to give me rest? Well, I like the way Paul puts it in Romans chapter 8, where he says that if God kept his promise to die for us, how will he not graciously give us all things? In other words, God made a promise to Abraham and to all of us who are children of Abraham because we believe in Jesus Christ. He gave a promise to Abraham and said, if you don't keep the covenant, I'll die in your place. When Jesus died on the cross, God kept that promise. And since God kept that promise, you can count on him to keep every other promise that we find in his word. In fact, Paul reiterates that in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20, when he says, all God's promises are yes in Jesus Christ. You can count on it. And I love what Jesus says in the next chapter in Matthew, Matthew chapter 12. Verse 20, he says that a bruised reed God will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In other words, when we, are come, when we come to God with our shoulders stooped and our head down, heavy with burdens, God doesn't say, you know, I told you so. If you would only listen to my word, this wouldn't have happened, or such and such. God doesn't pour salt in the, or rub salt in the wound. Jesus says, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. God understands where we're coming from, and he welcomes us, and he ministers to us. Jesus says, I will give you rest. I will give you rest. It's a gift, no strings attached. All we have to do is come to him. And he says, I will give you rest. Rest from our burdens. And especially, Jesus is talking about rest from our burden of sin. He has taken our sin away. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. And that is a burden, that burden of shame, of guilt. We can now come to God without that shame and guilt. We can come to him confidently, as the writer of Hebrews says, because we have a high priest who went through everything that we did without sin. But what about the other burdens that we carry? What about the burden of grief? The burden of financial issues? The burden of family relational problems? What about those burdens? Why? And and people asked that question 20 years ago. People asked, why did two planes fly into the World Trade Center? and into the Pentagon, and Flight 93 crash in Pennsylvania. Why? Why did that happen? Or we might ask the question, why does a loved one suffer for a number of years with cancer before they pass away? Why? Why do we still carry those burdens? Those are hard questions to answer. We don't know. When God says that my ways are greater than, than his ways, we are look at things from street level, you might say, where God is looking at it from a whole different perspective. The Bible tells us that God knows the end from the beginning. I came across a story that helps me at least 
understand a bit why we still are carrying burdens. It's about a missionary, a missionary to Abyssinia. He told of this valuable lesson he had learned from the natives. Lacking bridges, they were often compelled to wade across swollen streams to reach their destination. The current was swift and there was constant danger of being swept off their feet into deeper water or among treacherous rocks. The weight of the human body being only slightly heavier than water, it was difficult to maintain a foothold when waist deep in the stream. The natives therefore solved the problem by slinging a, st a sack of stone over their shoulder for extra ballast to weigh them down so their feet would not slip. When they reached the other side, they emptied the sack on the bank. He says, so too the Lord places upon us burdens which seem to weigh us down, but in reality keep us from slipping and falling. And he says, to give us spiritual traction, God often keeps us down so that he may keep us up. Jesus promises to give us rest. Well, our job is to come. Jesus then gives us rest. And finally, Jesus makes this offer. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, first glance at that, it seems like a contradiction. Jesus first says, I will give you rest, and then he says, take my yoke upon you. If you look up synonyms for the word yoke, you'll find words like enslavement and bondage and servitude. And those type of things don't sound much like rest, at least not to me. What is Jesus talking about there? Well, I think part of our problem is that we're not from the culture that Jesus was speaking to. And they would understand what Jesus was saying for two reasons. Number one, the word yoke was used to describe the relationship between a rabbi and his students or disciples. They would be yoked together in that they would talk together, they would travel together, they would study the word together. They were together all the time, and so they were described as being yoked to each other. And Jesus is saying, I want to be yoked to you. I want to be connected to you. But secondly, is the yoke itself. It's a wooden bar or a frame that's put around the oxen. And, and we may not be that familiar with it because we're not farmers. At least most of us are not farmers, and, and we don't see these things. But you may not be able to see this way in the back or see it well, but you all know what a yoke looks like, a, a wooden frame, and, and how that's used on oxen to, uh, com to combine them so that they can pull a load together or plow a field together. And I came across another story in a devotional that I'd used a number of years ago. It talks about what... Jesus is saying here. He says, if I can find it. He says, one day, a man went to see a farmer who was plowing his field in a team of, with a team of oxen. The man noticed that one of the animals was seemingly a little bigger than the other, so he asked him about it. The response from the farmer was very interesting. He said that the big animal was an older animal that was well-trained, and the smaller one was a young animal that never knew, was new to the yoke. The man went on to inquire as to why put them together, and this was the answer that he gave. Well, you see, the farmer said it's like this. The older ox is the best ox I have ever had. He knows his way around the field. The reason I put the younger one with him is so the older more knowledgeable ox could teach him how to plow. If I never put them together, the younger one would never learn. By himself, the younger ox would pull himself to death. But together, he learns to cooperate with and rest in the strength of the older ox. You see, when we are yoked to Jesus, we get the benefit of his strength. 
that he carries the major part of the load, that he teaches us how to plow, as it were, the field of life. And Jesus, of course, who has an eternity of experience, and we only have 50, 60, 70, maybe 80 years, we need to learn from Jesus, and we need to yield to his authority. We may be yoked to Jesus, we may be connected to him, but maybe we're, we're not following him. Maybe we are fighting him and trying to go in our own direction. And that hurts because we're connected to Jesus. We need to follow and submit to him. And what does Jesus mean when he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light? Well, one of the things I learned is that they would make that yoke so that it was fit the oxen just right and that it wouldn't hurt them when they pulled. And the other thing that we know is that Jesus took the whole burden of sin upon himself. He carried our sorrows, our infirmities, as we read in Isaiah 53. And so that burden he has taken away. In fact, what Jesus was getting at here was he was speaking especially to the Pharisees and the leaders of the people, the, the uh, uh, teachers of the law. In Luke 11, verse 46, Jesus says to them, Woe to you, experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help. Compare that to Jesus' yoke that he has taken the burden of sin away from us. He is, his yoke is easy. You see, the people, they, they tried to keep all these laws that the Pharisees uh, made up, and it became a burden to them. And Jesus says, I've taken that burden away completely. We can do his will in his strength. But what do we take away from this message this morning? mentioned before that probably every one of us here carries a burden. Are you anxious? Are you worried about something? Is there something maybe that you are carrying uh, that is just weighing you down? And maybe there are times that you think, I just want to give up. Stop the world. I want to get off. Are you coming to Jesus to help you, to give you rest? Maybe you're connected to Jesus, but you're fighting him. You're trying to go in a different direction. The good news this morning is that Jesus calls us to come to him. Psalm 55, verse 22 says, Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. In Psalm 68, verse 19, I love this one. Praise be to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. It's only if we come to him and stay connected to him. In John 15, verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But when we are yoked to him, when we are connected to him, we can do all things. Finding rest doesn't mean a life of inactivity. It doesn't mean a life that's completely free of burdens. Yes, the burden of sin, but we still carry burdens with us but it means that we can carry them through the strength of Jesus Christ. Someone has said, for when the heart yields, Christ is Lord, and when Christ is Lord, there is rest. We're seeking true rest from Jesus Christ, and that true rest someday will become perfect rest. Let me finish by reading the last verses, 27 through 31 of Isaiah 41 or 40. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Like, I've got a burden. You're, you're not listening to me, Lord. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. 
They will walk and not be faint. Where are you, where am I, finding rest for our souls? True rest is found only in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our dear God and Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this, these words of Jesus this morning, words that we've heard many times, but, Lord, words that we need to be reminded of because we are so forgetful. Lord, we all have come here this morning with some type of a burden, and, Lord, especially maybe the burden of sin. We pray, Lord, that you would take away that burden as we come to you. And, and the other burdens that we carry, Lord, we pray that we would bring them to you. For as we just read, that you daily carry our burdens. Help us, Lord, to be yoked to you, to listen to you, to, to submit to your authority, and then to find rest for our souls. Help us, Lord. Give us the grace. Please give us the strength that we might find true rest in you. In your name we pray. Amen.